Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Hankenius. I am the head of FITM's program for digital marketing and uh, happy to spend this next hour with you talking about the future of e-commerce. Let's, let's start with a few numbers. If, if you follow these, you know I like to talk numbers first. Black Friday foot traffic down 52% from last year. Online revenue, on the other hand, over Black Friday weekend grew 23% from 2019. A week ago, WWD reported Cyber Monday sales as nearly $11 billion, up 11 or up 15% rather from 2019. I have mentioned this on past webinars. There are retail leaders that we have spoken with here at the college, I've talked to personally, who have told me they are adjusting their income sheets for 2020 to now expect anywhere in the neighborhood of 60, 70% of their sales to be direct to consumer, mostly via e-commerce channels. It's not to say that no one saw this coming though. Nike's been moving away from their wholesale for a couple of years now. I think the thing that the pandemic really has done though, and that has surprised me at least, is increase the speed of the conversion of retail from brick and mortar to e-commerce. For years, we've seen quarterly growth of e-commerce hovering around 15%. The last year, actually the last quarter, Q3 2020, sales of e-commerce were up 37%. That's just over one quarter. So it's a lot of numbers. Numbers don't always tell very good stories. And that is why we're actually here today is to give some context to those stories. And we have two, I think, of the best people to talk to us about this for the next hour. Uh, Kim Tobin was general manager of Savage X Fenty. She then went on to serve as chief revenue officer at the Goop Books Company, most recently served as president of Skim's Body. She'll be joining us in a few minutes. Our first guest though is Tracy Inglis. She was president of global fashion brands at Textile before becoming president and then incumbent CEO at Retail Wins, the parent company of such brands as New York & Co, uh, Gabriel Union, Ava Mendez. She's going to join us now to give us a sense of what she sees as the state of e-commerce and how it might look moving forward. Tracy, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Tom. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is the future of e-commerce. And so we wanted to kick off the discussion with some predictions that we're calling here and now. And the notion is that these are all anchored in that the, the concept that e-commerce will continue to evolve to ensure that the customer experience is seamless, meaning easy to buy, reduces risk, meaning easy to try, and fast, meaning minimal waiting. We've broken these into three separate groupings, and first is, is develop. And so these are um, areas that we believe are emerging innovations that will morph and thrive. Then we'll talk about scale, which are existing innovative experiences that will just continue to be adopted by more and more retailers and more and more consumers. And then lastly, we'll talk about disruption. And these are new innovations that we're predicting that will disrupt our norms. So let's start in the first area, talking about BOPIS or BOPAC. Now that stands for buy online, pick up in store or buy online, pick up at curb or a curbside pickup. And so what we know about this is, is shelter in place orders earlier this year that were designed to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 had another major outcome in that it forced retailers to rapidly innovate and pick up on new and, and existing innovations and adoptions in digital technology. So Shopify announced after their Q2 2020 quarter that 39% of their brick and mortar merchants in English speaking geographies are now using some form of local in-store curbside pickup and delivery solution, which is up from 2% at the end of February 2020. So what we saw earlier this year is a massive change in adoption of buy online pickup in store or buy online pickup at curb in a way that we've never seen before. We're predicting that this will continue to grow until it's north of 50%. And frankly, the retailers who don't end up adopting it will struggle in, in revenue. Next, let's talk about digital payments. So digital payments, we've seen a lot of innovation recently in the digital payment space. I think we'll continue to see a lot of massive adoption. Um, recently, McKinsey uh, quoted that nearly 50% of global shoppers are using digital payments more than they did before the pandemic. 
50% of all global shoppers, that's huge, have changed the way they use digital payments. And we've seen some really interesting innovations with split payments layaway, small credit microloans, and other interesting ways to pay. The ease of using digital payment where it already populates your address information and your credit card information is just so seamless for the consumer that we'll continue to see this space grow as more and more retailers adopt digital payments. Mobile first prioritization. Uh, we first talked about this, you know, back in 2013, I think is when, when I first started talking about this. Um, and back then it was kind of a, a head scratcher, you know, ideas that people would laugh about. But we're seeing now that um, over 50% of traffic on average to retailers is coming from a mobile device. And for me personally, the brands that I've worked for, it's closer to 80 and 90%. So I think this will just continue to see that grow until it's by far the majority of traffic. And retailers will have to adjust their practices to make sure that they're QAing on mobile first, to make sure that they're really designing for a mobile experience and meeting the customer where they are versus spending so much time working on the desktop version. And then last in this uh, section is the digital personalization. So um, I think this is an area that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think we'll see continued improvement in this. It's something that we've barely started to scratch the surface as retailers. Um, and there's no reason we can't use our digital cues and our data about our customers to replicate that personal in-store clientele experience. There are some retailers who are doing this really well and some retailers who've been uh, really behind the ball on it. I think we'll continue to see that in improve as we go. On the next section, we're talking about developing. Um, some really fun, interesting things here, talking about digitally enabled decision-making. There are some brands that have started using augmented reality to help you try things on at home to help make your decision before you decide what to purchase. Uh, there's a brand called Wanna Kicks that you can see, you can hold up your foot, twist it around, you can see what the shoe looks like on your leg. Um, Nike has also tested in this environment. Uh, sunglasses and beauty have been doing this for a while now and, and the furniture area as well. So you can, you know, Wayfair can do a try it in your room. The technology is not perfect. Sometimes Sometimes you test it out and the couch ends up sitting on top of the lamp. Um, so I think there are ways that this will continue to evolve and become more and more the everyday norm. Next is innovations in try before you buy. So we tested try before you buy at Just Fab several years ago. Um, and the idea behind it is that it takes away the risk of the financial obligation of having to pay for something before you are able to try it on. Uh, and now Amazon is testing this concept as well. Things will be sent to you and you don't have to pay for them unless you decide to keep them. Um, let's play this video. I think there's some really interesting concepts going on here. So you can see this drone flies up to deliver something to a consumer who pays with a digital payment and then gets their pizza. So this is a futuristic version of what delivery for try before you buy might be like. Not in pizza, obviously no one wants to try that before they buy it, um, but imagine if you were shopping for watches or jewelry or uh, the perfect white t-shirt and a drone could deliver 10 different options to you to try on in the comfort of your own home and then immediately send back the things that you don't want to keep. So that takes away the risk of the loss time from having to go to the uh, to FedEx or the post office, find print out a label to return it, find a box, find packing tape. I don't know about you guys, but I find that all very annoying. Um, and so, you know, this would prevent you from being able to, to, to have to do that. Next is digitally assisted in-store browsing. Now I did hear of one retailer who started to test into this, but I think this will be table stakes going forward, which is you spend time online pre-shopping before you go to a store and then a store, you can curate a um, fitting room cart, if you will, so that the store associate can then pull all of those things you wanna try on, have them waiting for you in the fitting room when you get there and have an opportunity to cross sell and upsell into different categories categories, or the store associate might know things like this one runs small or runs big, so I'm going to grab another size for you. They might even be able to bring you a latte and make it a nice little um, fun experience in store. Uh, I think that this will be something that retailers start to adopt pretty broadly in the next few years. 
And next is using retail hubs as mini distribution centers. So we know that a traditional brick and mortar retailer has always had allocators that predict what people are going to be buying in each store and send ahead product in anticipation of meeting that demand. That is the classic retail model. E-commerce, I think, will start to take a page from that book and start using retails, uh, retail stores as mini distribution centers using predictive technology and strong allocation background to, to understand what people will be buying in a given area and sending things there in advance so that you're shortening the delivery time for a consumer versus the way that most e-commerce brands do it nowadays, which is having one e-com distribution center or maybe two for, to service all of the United States. Next, let's talk about disruption. Uh, so one thing that is pretty clear is that we're going to have increased channels of commerce. So we've traditionally thought of the, the channels of commerce is basically two channels. There's a stores and then there's e-commerce. And then we start talking about app, but what really is happening is an explosion of shopping channels. Social is a channel. Direct TV is a channel. Um, the, I think over uh, out of home experience with smart ads will start to become a channel. This experience that you can see in the image here is a wall in a subway in, I believe it was in the UK and this is Tesco, where uh, it, customers could walk up to this screen Screen and use their smartphone to take a, a, Q, a picture of the QR code to create a shopping cart of groceries that would then be delivered to the customer's house by the time they got home from work. I think we'll start to see more and more things like that where the channel is actually not just a traditional channel of e-commerce or stores, but instead lots of multiple different options of channels. Next is near real-time buying. So the consumers have shopped as more buy now, wear now for many years. And a lot of fashion brands have been slow to adopt to that um, for fear of change or for respect of tradition. The fashion show calendar really hasn't shifted. Now that we're seeing more and more brands starting a more direct relationship with their consumer, they'll start to get the data about when customers are shopping for what. And I think we'll see more and more shifting to real time buy, where, uh, buy now, wear now type of uh, fashion calendars. Next is retail liquidations and acquisitions. We have seen plenty of them in 2020 and actually plenty of them in 2019 before the pandemic as well. I think what we'll see is continued liquidations and acquisitions. I think we'll continue to see the, um, you know, the separation, a bifurcation of retailers who are able to be consumer led and digital first, um, and those who aren't able to make these adoptions and innovations. Um, and we'll start to see, we'll, we'll continue to see a lot of change over there. And last and not least is the return process. So like I mentioned earlier, there's something really cumbersome about having to find a box and print a label and get tape and take it to FedEx or take it to USPS. And so I think what we'll see are continued innovations and disruption to the return process. I'm calling it, I think that in the next five years, returning something that you bought online will be easier than returning something that you bought in store. That are the 12, Predictions, there they are. That's it. It's it's so excellent, um, Tracy, and thank you for putting that together for us. And so maybe we can dive into a few a few questions related to it. But I, what really caught my attention, specifically on that last point you made, is around you know I, I had read something where I think normally thirty percent of product is returned with this new world of COVID and e-commerce shopping. We're expecting closer to forty percent. So I, I I know I'm throwing sort of a, a curveball at you, but do you think some of the new technologies that you spoke about will kind of help decrease the amount of return, the number of returns, or do we just simplify it and that's really the solution? I think it's both. So the more we can simplify the informed decision-making process, allowing people to try before they buy, um, you know, an AR to, to try things on, I think all of those technologies will help reduce the returns on the back end. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think the return process has to be made easier. Well, and it's, I, I love that you keep bringing up the technology because that's the piece I'm most interested in, that, that short video you showed, uh, even thinking about the iPhone that's rolled out uh, this year, the 12, and the LiDAR technology in it that's going to enable better AR. You know, it reminds me of like Warby Parker, who the initial brand is all about sending, you know, you can, you can be sent the glasses, try on the glasses at home, 
Warby Parker waits and waits and waits until Apple finally has enough data points in the AR and the technology of the camera that allows you to really do a, an effective try on. And now this new one, I think doubled or tripled what was available in the previous phone. So I, you can see where technology is going to play so much of a bigger role in this, which then makes me wonder to you, is that why we've not seen as many companies embracing, I, maybe just let's talk about the technology to start. Has it just not there, been there and it's only catching up at the same time as COVID or is it because of COVID and this, this transition to e-commerce that the brands are now starting to lean in a little harder? Yeah, I think the technology will continue to be better and it was probably insufficient in the past, but it was there. And there were some retailers, Target, for example, has had buy online pickup in store for a long time. And they really reap the rewards of being digital led um, and customer first uh, from, from having that during the pandemic. Um, I think it, it really what has prevented this progress and prior to the pandemic was just a comfort level of more traditional ways of doing it. Almost a, I think retailers or omni retailers were a victim of their own mediocre success in the past. And so, you know, if things aren't broken, don't fix it. And there was really no need, no, um, you know, impetus to really force that innovation and change rapidly. And then a pandemic hit and the stores were closed and suddenly, they were forced to innovate. And it was really interesting to see how quickly our industry could adopt new practices. Which I guess the logical next question is, who do you think is doing it well? Who's, who has embraced these best practices, these new best practices? Obviously, Amazon. Amazon's had their eye on the prize um, for a long time. While everyone was looking at Amazon, Amazon was looking at the consumer and saying, how do we make this easier for them? Um, Target has done an excellent job. I think Zolando in the, in the UK has been really uh, advanced. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of the direct to consumer brands, textile fashion group, um, you know, has been really advanced on, on personalization for a long time um, and, and direct to consumer best practices in general. Uh, if you were to think about an organization that might be watching right now and, and you were advising them in some way, what, what are sort of the first steps they need to think about in terms of infrastructure, in terms of how to roll out this, this new future? I think the most important thing would be that marketing and IT need to have a lock solid partnership. The marketing team being the voice of the consumer, um, being the leader of these types of shopping innovations needs to be hand in hand with the CTO laying out the roadmap um, and really getting that support um, to be able to roll these adoptions out for the customer. That's, that is interesting. So that the, the, I guess the leveling of the playing field or the equalizing of the departments, do you see that in more than just marketing and tech? Do you see that you know, across the whole company or is really just those two you think? Well, I think those two in the past were more order takers. So they, you know, the, the, the merchant team and the design team would come up with beautiful product and then they would explain to the marketing team how to market it, um, which now that things are, the marketing team is, is more responsible for, um, you know, the whole shopping process and, and the voice of the customer. It really levels the, the playing field, if you will, but I don't think they should be seen as as comp competition or competitors to each other, they should really be seen as harmonizing together. Product is the most important thing. You know, product is king, marketing is queen. Um, so, and you need tech to be able to support that. But again, it's not just about telling the tech team what it is that you need. It's about having a partnership where they tell you what, what you need as well. Um, so it's, it's really more of, um, of a harmonious relationship between the areas, whereas in the past, it was most retailers were very heavily merchant driven and merchant led. I feel like that is the thing that I have heard the most this year too. And it, it, this is actually the perfect place to introduce Kim then to talk a little bit about more on that merger. But I've, I've heard this over and over again, sort of the the way we have to rethink our companies and the structure of the company. Um, so I would like to introduce Kim to turn and ask her to turn her camera on. While I do that, just a quick reminder, I, we've all done this before, but there is the Q&A button at the bottom. Please feel free to submit a question down there. Um, we did save some time with these two amazing executives to spend some time with us at the end, answering some of your questions as well. Um, Kim, I, I already said you were with Skims, you were with Textile before that. 
Um, you've worked in these interesting businesses that layer in different models than just traditional retail. Um, Savage X Fenty has subscriptions, as does Books. Uh, most recently, you were at Skims, which has you know something called a drop model, which is about newness and moving through inventory quickly. I, I wonder if you can speak to and sort of level set what all of these different shopping methodologies are about. Yeah, so I think the, the story is really all about engagement. How do you get people to come to your site and want to engage with you on a regular basis? I think when you think about what the retail shopping experience was, 25 years ago, like the engagement was you'd go to the mall or you'd go to the shopping centers and you'd visit those same stores and you'd go in and you check it out. Now you can do things from the comfort of your own home or even, you know, sitting at a restaurant on your phone. And so why does a customer want to think about coming to you again and again? And that's all about creating engagement with subscription or the flexible subscription model of textile. It's creating a reason to just come and check it out. Now you're top of mind for the customer. You know, they're thinking, oh, wow, Fabletics might have some new, you know, their new leggings drop this, you know, in the first of the month or just fab. It's their, you know, it's their shoes every single, every single month. And I think that is about creating a moment for people to want to come back and, and see what is, uh, available at your store. And I think what's similar with brands like Skims, or you think about even, you know, Kith and Supreme and a few other big brands that have really explored the, the idea of drop models. It's, it's an urgency factor as well. So how are you engaging those customers? And then the reason for, for showing up. So you want to make sure you get it before it sells out. It's a hot commodity. And so I think that that's where brands like Supreme have done a really good job with sort of the resurgence of their brand is creating a moment of I got to get in and I got to get out, which is, you know, scarcity, as we know, as a marketing tactic is a great way to, to leverage an enthusiasm for the brand. Which is interesting because it, it speaks to what we were just talking about with Tracy. So, so thinking through these things, not just as a buyer or as a marketer, but as a combined buyer marketer um, seems to be, I, I guess, where, where we're all headed. Um, thinking about a sense of urgency, though, uh, and thinking about the different trends that we've seen emerge this year, uh, is is there one thing that you're seeing um, that's been the biggest learning of 2020? <laughs> 2020 has been like daily learnings for all of us, right? right. I think <laughs> to, to what you and Tracy were speaking about earlier, uh, 2020 just made it an, an absolute must have for businesses to think about an omni-channel presence. I think that there's been a big shift in a lot and in a lot of new brands over the past five years have launched digitally native or with a major focus on e-commerce. And this year, you know, the brands that were more traditional that hadn't figured out their e-commerce platform have had no choice but to think about their e-commerce platform. And so all 2020 did was accelerate what was already happening. And, you know, again, I think that retail and in-store experience is never, it's not going to go away. And I feel like it's such a, it's such a, a, a fallacy to say, you know, retail's dead. Retail's evolving. And I think, you know, to what Tracy just said, there's a lot of great examples. It's not just on your phone or on your computer. There's so many other new ways of exploring the shopping experience for customers. And I think 2020 has just had to be, you know, push everyone to get way more creative with what that omni-channel experience means. You and I were talking before and you said that really we should think of the brick and mortar retail as, as part of our marketing. Like that is part of your brand. So explain that, like sort of unpack what that means. Yeah, so I think that in traditional retail, you think about either your wholesale experience where you know, you're selling to a department store or you have your own store experience. And those, you know, at the time, you know, e-commerce didn't exist. And then e-commerce came around and, and the more traditional brands still focused on, on their main brick and mortar experience. And the digitally native brands focused on e-commerce. And then what you've seen recently, and a lot of brands have done this, Textile with Fabletics has done a really good job. Glossier has done some interesting brick and mortar experiences where it's about layering and, and thinking about not just here's your website experience and here's your store experience, but how do you utilize the, the all of your experiences in a symbiotic relationship? So 
How are you using your e-commerce customers to drive to something in the store to build a more personal relationship? How are you utilizing the information you have about your in-store customers to talk about things that are happening online? They shouldn't be mutually exclusive. And I think if you think about, you know, digitally native brands, when you were thinking about maybe going into wholesale or maybe, you know, having a physical presence in a kiosk or a store or whatever that looks like, it's about customer share and, and mind share. And you want to find, create an experience that tells your brand story. It's not about just selling the product, although selling product is obviously important, but it can have such a bigger impact when you think about your storefront as another way to advertise your business. And I think that that's really where so many of the brands that have done, um, an omni-channel experience in recent years have done such a smart job where they're not just thinking about the stores run themselves and the e-commerce site runs themselves. It's how do we continue to create that fulfilling circle of customer experience and think about everyone's journey um, and not make it seem like that's my store customer and that's my e-commerce customer. It, it, you put me in the mind of, I, I've taught in our beauty program at the college. And one of the things that we teach the beauty students, or at least at a point in time in the branding course, we taught the beauty students that you really had to pick your channel, right? Like you were mass and so you could be in CVS, but you then could not be in Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. And over the course of my time here at the college, which is about six years, that has kind of eroded that the line between you can find a brand now in CVS that you might also see in Nordstrom. And I wonder if in fashion retail, is it the same? It, it is, does, when you think about the position of your brand and the mm -hmm. channel you're choosing, the retailer that you're choosing to sell through, could you be in a, um, a DSW and a Macy's and a Nordstrom? Yeah, I think you're seeing a lot of brands choose that path. I mean, I think there's a lot of premium brands that'll show up in a DSW nowadays because they want to meet their customer where they're at. I think Nike is a really good example, right? Nike still maintains this quality brand ethos and what they're about. And they've done such a good job over the decades that they've been around. But you also know that you can find some Nike products in DSW. You also know that you're going to have some fashion Nike products in a Neiman Marcus or a Nordstrom. And so it's really about thinking about all the customers you could potentially reach and meeting them where they are. And I really think it, it people think about direct to consumer as e-commerce as like direct to consumer brands feels like a synonymous term with a website that's digitally native. I think to me, what direct to consumer means is being where your customers directly are. And if you feel like your customer, you know, you make a running shoe and DSW has, you know, a big athletic shoe department, why wouldn't you want to explore how you can be there? You know, you want to figure out what that brand ex experience is so that the customers at Neiman Marcus feel like they're, they're that premium experience and the DSW customer doesn't feel like they're paying an arm and a leg. That might be the, but I think that you know, Nike is a good example of a brand that's been able to build all of that together um, and being attractive to all demographics of customers. But at the same time, you know, as I already alluded to, Nike has, has announced and has pulled out of a lot of the retailers they were in before. So is, is there a strategy that you would advise a brand should think about when they're picking the retailers, their wholesaler accounts? I think that the biggest, I mean, listen, the, the best margin is when you sell it by yourself to your customer directly. That is your best margin. So that's gonna be your best money maker. So I think that, you know, to, to what we were discussing a little bit earlier, you have to think about your wholesales as strategic partners. And you don't have to necessarily be everywhere to, to be able to get to those customers. And the goal is to be as profitable as possible and make as much money as you can. <laughs> I mean, it's business. So I think that you wanna be strategic. And if, you know, at the, at the end of the day, and especially this year, right? Like wholesale has been a real beast of a business. If you, if that has been your main channel, it has really forced you to think more strategically about, it doesn't mean that you don't want to partner with wholesale ever again. You just have to think about how big of the wholesale business is, is for your whole pie of your business, right? Like there, there are plenty of brands out there where 90% of their business was wholesale. And then this year, the 10% of their business, which was e-commerce became 100% of their business. So you have to be able to think about, you know, not that, oh, I mean, God forbid we have another pandemic, but you want to think about how do I not become so overly reliant on one channel and in theory, your least profitable channel when you can sell directly to your customer, whether it's via your own store or an e-commerce site. And I think that that's probably why a lot of brands have taken this moment to, to 
you know, things have been moving and then Tracy, I think, spoke to it really well earlier. It, it's been just sort of a pattern of what these brands have done. And this year was this jolt of, we got to rethink about our business and what does it mean? Who do you think is, I know you mentioned uh, Just Fab already, but are there other brands or even going further to Just Fab if you want that, that you think like really exemplify the, this idea of everything you've been talking about, you know, thinking about the channels, also thinking about what you call direct to consumer, a little different definition than like we would normally give it, mm -hmm. which, which brands are actually doing it quite well and why? Yeah, I think, you know, speaking of the Just Fab family with Fabletics, they launched stores several years ago and they've done a really beautiful job of making sure that the store experience syncs up with their e-commerce experience. It's really an omni-channel, you know, they're, they're really thinking about all of their customers as one and how they work well together. Glossier ha also has some stores and they've also done partnerships with Nordstrom. Um, I can guarantee that every single major, you know, beauty counter type business, whether it's, um, you know, all of the, the Neiman Marcus, the Saks, the Macy's that would all probably kill to have a Glossier, in, but they're not going to all of those places. They want to be strategic about where they are and make sure that they're getting the right partners and the right dollars behind it from those brands. So I think that there's been a, you know, I think the most intriguing omni-channel brands have been birthed out of the digitally native brands. So they launched online and then were able to expand their wings and grow their wings outside of that space. But they focus, I think what those, those businesses had the advantage in is this real-time data in e-commerce, you know who your customers are, they're shopping on your site and you get a lot of information. And if you're doing your job right as a brand, you're trying to get more and more information about your customers, you know, whether it's via some sort of quiz experience or, you know, asking them to fill out surveys. And then you're able to then determine, okay, where else should we be? Oh, our customers love shopping at Nordstrom. All right, so Nordstrom seems like the good partner to be with or our customers, you know, these are the other brands that they like and those they seem to go to those stores a lot. Maybe we should think about starting our own flat, having a flagship store and testing out the concept. And so you utilize that data to then make those decisions where it's a little harder the other way around when you're in a store and you don't get that chance to learn as much about your customers as you can online. Um, I, I will pay you a great compliment in that you have run some of these very successful companies. You have started them from the ground up and helped build them. Um, so I, I wonder when you think about the structure of an organization and, you know, Tracy and I were talking about just a few minutes ago, the merger of technology and marketing and, and these things, if, if you were to work in the perfect environment, design the company of your dreams, what does sort of the, the structure look like in the way that your different departments interact together? How do you get marketing and tech, CMO, CTO to speak the same language? So I think that because um, digitally native brands, you know, the, over the past less than a decade, but have really started, there's a lot of really um, great talent out there that are starting within that space and understand already that relationship between tech, marketing, and I would say merchandising. I think ultimately, you know, to sell something online, you need a product. So it can't just be a marketing driven conversation, but the, the, exactly what Tracy said, where it was merchandising, filling to, you know, filling information to marketing and then marketing telling the story. Now it's really coming together because marketing's pulling the data, marketing's getting the customer and can help inform merchandising too, which makes their job a heck of a lot easier. When you think about, you know, the biggest expenses in a business, especially in a digitally native business, you're looking at inventory, you're looking at marketing spend, which is how you are growing your business and driving your revenue. And then it's headcount. And so, um, to make the most out of that, you have to make sure that your technology and, and marketing and merchandising departments are supporting each other and having those conversations and planning the business for the future together, not just as one-sided as, you know, and when you think about old school fashion, where it's concept being then pushed through the pipeline, it is so much more uh, collaborative now than it traditionally was. So, which is a kind of an interesting point to, to sort of dive off of. And I feel like you might be somewhat redundant in the answer, but maybe not. Um, when you think about a startup, so many of our students and alums are very entrepreneurial. We, we live in a society now that is very entrepreneurial, startup focused. So when you think about a startup and you, and you think about your experiences in building these brands, what does a, what does a entrepreneur need to think about now? What, what should be top of mind as they build that company? 
I think product and the idea first, right? I think that you have to think, you know, what do you have that you want to sell? And it doesn't have to be groundbreaking, brand new technology, although that's always great. But what do you see as a gap out there in, in the marketplace that you want to, you know, fill with some kind of product? And then I think it's really understanding the marketing because that is really what can drive a business. I mean, you can have, you can buy inventory and buying inventory can mean a hundred products and you can test some Facebook and Instagram ads around what kind of messaging works to support that business and get a lot of learnings pretty quickly. That will then give you more confidence to potentially buy more inventory and continue the cycle of then spending more. But, you know, I, I think that the beauty of what digital marketing has is really fast real-time information. When you think about, you know, yesteryear where it's billboards and commercials, like the, you're not getting real-time information. You're hoping you're telling the story and that people are hearing the message and going to shop your brand. But now I can see the customer shopping in real time and learn about what they're buying and how they're buying it. And or what ad did I put up that resonated the best with the customer? Which one got the most clicks? Which ones converted the best? And utilize that to then help inform uh, mm -hmm. our, our, your merchandising inventory decisions. As I invite Tracy to turn her camera back on and, and answer the same question, I'll just, I would add, one of the things I have noticed in the startup culture is they don't always or aren't always as aware of the data. And I think I can't underline enough what you're saying there is being aware of the data you can collect on your consumer. And it, you know, it was an eye opening eye opener for me when you said to me, I think a week ago we were talking and you said, yes, and it's okay to sell out because it tells you where you can order more next time. Yeah, you're leaving money on the table and that's not the best plan, but it works. Um, Tracy, I wonder when you think of the startup space, what, it, what would be your advice for an entrepreneur entering retail today? Uh, well, let me go to my slides. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but there's no, I, great I think, slides. <laughs> I think um, having a social presence and thinking of it not just it's super important as a storytelling presence, but it's also a, a commerce presence. So think of it in that way as well. Um, you're acquiring customers to your brand. And then don't be afraid to invest in paid social to grow your brand and to drive acquisition. Um, and then pay really close attention to your customer. Pay so much more attention to your customer than your competition. So you should be living and breathing any data or information you can get on them. When, they, when you look at sales of products, that's your customer voting with their wallet. So you know that they like this and they don't like this. If something intrigues you or, or didn't sell how you thought it would, email them, find out, call them, figure out why did you like product A more than product B. Read your comments on, on customer reviews. Make sure that you're reading everything about your brand so that you're really close to your customer and understand it. I think that I would underline what you just said about calling your customer, you know, in, in design thinking models, which is what we teach here at the college, is, is all about being in touch with your customer. And it's not just digital. I can't underline enough, like pick up the phone, send an email and see if you can schedule a Zoom. Like there's so much value that comes out of these one-on-one, -on -one. like the insights are, are so informative. Um, well, I think what's interesting, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say at Express and then again at, at Just Fab, um, we would actually spend time in the customer's home. So we would see their, their products that they had bought from our store in their closet next to other products from other stores um, how they how they style it, you know, all of that. It's it's really informative. Kim, did Kim freeze on us? I think Kim may have frozen. Oh no, technology. Um, I will. I'll jump into uh, Kim. I think you might be back. I am. Sorry about that. That's okay. It happens. Welcome to 2020. <laughs> <laughs> did you have anything you wanted to add on that 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 whole notion of like human centered research and design? Yeah, I think that one, and it's it's amazing how many businesses that I've spoken with, um, you know, just in, in my career, who aren't thinking customer first yet, even though it should be the most important data point that you have. And I, you know, people focus on customer service, but it. it it doesn't have to just be that department who talks to the customers. And I know that, you know, Tracy really built out that whole program at Textile and Adjust Fab of getting that, you know, research around the customer. And it's, it's surprising how many brands are just turning out product and they're seeing the sales and, you know, so you just keep doing that. And 
it does feel cumbersome to reach out and speak with customers at times. It does. It takes time and effort and when you're really busy, but some of your best data is going to come from really spending time understanding your customers and picking up the phone and, and, and having those conversations. And it is a hard thing to get people within a business, especially, especially I would say like the generation, our generation who are now so digitally centric and are so comfortable with like ordering things online. And, and there's a lot of good data that comes in just from the customer shopping online, but that impersonal in-person experience, whether, and I, and I mean in person, like the, the phone call or a Zoom in, in the modern day, uh, all of that is such, it is such great data to also be had. And you just, and I think that so many brands overlook that until it feels a little late and you're like, we don't know anything about our customer. Um, I, I know of companies that have, have done just what you guys are describing, right? Done this one-on-one -on -one with their customer and then been able to go back to their data query the data with an insight they got from that one-on-one -on -one experience and that has changed the model. I mean, there's there's two companies IPOing this week who, who went through that, uh, both of them are perfect case studies on that as well. Uh, a couple Q&A questions for you guys, let's, let's get to. Um, in the online model, the most common reason for return, what would it be? Was it the wrong product, a faulty product, product not the same as displayed? What, what do you guys see as that? Kim, you want to take that one first? I'll let Tracy take it. Tracy, why do people return stuff? It's been different for the different brands that I've worked for, but most of the time it's something that they that the customer couldn't see about the product um, on the online. So um, that fit doesn't fit well. Um, it's too small or it's too big or it's too short or it's too long. Um, and or you know, didn't like the color or the fabric. Kim, yeah. any additional insights? I I think that that's usually what it is. I think a lot of it comes down to fit in a world where, you know, and I, and I, you know, Zappos really pushed forward the concept of buying shoes online when people thought that felt absolutely impossible because the experience of, you know, trying on shoes um, felt like the most important thing to buying a pair of shoes. And then Zappos broke down that barrier with, by the way, excellent customer experience and support um, because they made it as, as easy as possible to return exchange, whatever that looks like. Um, but I think that that's really what it comes down to. Like in e-commerce, you, you know, you have to, like the try on experience is going to be in your home. And so that's really where it is. Which gets back to technology, which gets us to our next question, I think. Uh, so the question is in regards to Balenciaga showing their latest collection in a video game form, will there be more to follow such as brands partnering with game developers to integrate fashion designs into the games? Uh, I teach this. I, I cannot underline enough looking at different ways of reaching your customer. And if you think women don't game, go look at the data. Um, Tracy, I don't know. Do you want to jump in on this as well uh, in terms of yeah, gaming? Yeah, no, I think, um, I think this year because of COVID, uh, the, the fashion shows got really innovative. So it's, it's no longer the traditional model. Um, we're seeing you know, everything from printed books to video games, um, all kinds of interesting things that were, were happening in, in that area. Um, uh, you know, the, the video game space, I think absolutely, there probably will be continue to be more innovations, um, even uh, you know, purchasing different fashion brands for your avatar. Um, I think will continue to, you know, be a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the video game space, I think, yeah, women absolutely do game as well. Um, but I would think of it as in the future, a channel as well. So you can purchase directly within the video game and have a real product shipped to your house um, in that experience. Yeah, it's been really fun to watch the innovation. I think another example, when you think about how brands have had to rethink fashion innovation, um, shout out to the my my old um, colleagues at Savage X Fenty, when you think about what their fashion show, and I think that they've really broken down a lot of barriers in fashion show in general over the years, but in a world where you can't really have an audience, I think the show experience that they came up with, that they put together for Amazon was it, it did so many things for, you know, obviously it's about body inclusivity and it's about fashion being more than just, you know, your, your model walking down the runway, the whole experience of what the product looks like on the body when it's moving. Um, I think that it's great. I think the Balenciaga doing video games, I mean, it, 
this year has forced people to think so outside the box, which I think has made things really fun. And I don't see brands just immediately going back to traditional fashion shows in the future because now everyone's been pushed to, to try some new innovation and creativity and how to reach their customers in new ways. And I think that it's it'll be really fun to see what happens over the next um, couple of years there. And some of it we, we've talked about on this particular webinar and previous episodes of it, you know, looking at the way that people are doing events. I just saw a brand building their own game uh, for their specific brand. I saw another festival of some kind that has now moved into a digital format this year. So think of like taking Coachella and moving it digital as a game and moving around that experience and then being able to obviously access brands through those channels as well. Um, Chris Lim Chin, who you guys may know. We know uh, well. Hi, yep, Chris yep. Lim. <laughs> uh, she, she sent in a question which kind of echoes what a few people have asked. Um, do you have any advice for small businesses on how to play in the space against or with the bigger companies? What are the specific channels a small business may be needing to look at? Kim, I'll let you take that first. So I think that, uh, you know, Tracy at the nail on the head, social presence is really important. And also <laughs> it's really hard. I feel like I'm making myself sound like an old lady now, but like there's so many new social channels coming out all the time. And part of that is just being where their cost, again, being where the customers are and having that presence doesn't have to cost money right away. Um, but then being able to spend a little bit of money to test and learn on the business, I think is a really great way to understand a your customer b what the cost you know let you can let your customer help you frame what your marketing story can be now where it's not so tops down anymore it's much more interactive with the customer and so i think that the advantage that a small business or a new startup has on bigger companies is the ability to be nimble it is really hard to turn a really big ship it is much easier with a few people in an office to make a game time decision to completely change how you were thinking about your business. Maybe you were putting all of your ad dollars in Facebook and you started seeing some really impressive numbers on TikTok. Great. Pull out all your money on Facebook, put your money in TikTok. And you can do that way easier than a bigger brand can um, from a you know product standpoint. I think that there, it's the same thing. Um, so you get to be a lot more opportunistic. And I think, you know, and, and this goes to anyone thinking about joining a startup, whether you're starting a startup yourself or going to be part of a startup environment. And startup doesn't have to mean it started in this year. Like there are plenty of brands out there that are five to 10 years that are still startup-like. And you have to be comfortable with the idea of change. You have to be nimble. You have to be comfortable with the idea that the, the business is in this constant evolving space. And to come out ahead, you want to be able to play in every move that the business makes. And so just be comfortable with the fact that every day is going to be a learning experience, which I think is what has attracted me the most to startups is the fact that no two days are going to be the same, but I can learn a lot from both the failures and the wins. And I take all of that as a learning to then apply to tomorrow's efforts. Tracy, I wonder, as you think about that same question, if I can kind of scaffold on this next question that is related, this person asked to add to Chrislin, advanced innovations, including AI, undoubtedly require high investment. So what can and should small businesses focus on to maximize profit and also increase engagement, conversion, retention? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think to ask a small business to start doing um, artificial intelligence is, is, is too big of an ask, right? I think that's something that you don't really do until you have a, quite a large customer database to be able to have enough data to make sense of, of the AI, um, of the algorithms that come out of that to begin with. Um, but there's so much that you can do on a small scale to imitate that. So if you have a small amount of customers, you as a human can read your data and read your comments from your customers and replicate what an AI bot is gonna be able to do at a massive scale. Um, so you know, it, it, it boils down to what Kim said is, is know your numbers and know your customers. And so when you look every single day at you know, what areas of um, traffic are driving the most conversion and move around your marketing mix to make sure that you lean into the channels that are working really well. Um, and then couple that with qualitative feedback from your customers. That's where, that's where your small business advantage is. And I'll, I'll give you an example of where sometimes the, the data and the customer feedback don't match up. When I was at Limited Brands, Victoria's Secret had just launched their, their lip gloss and uh, it wasn't performing very well. 
And so they were thinking about shutting it down. And uh, one of the, the leaders at the time was in a store watching a customer try it with one of the little trial things and seeing how, how sticky it was. And the customer's you know, making some weird face with her lips. And then they realized that the product is not selling, not because people don't want to buy lip gloss from a lingerie brand, but because the product isn't what it should be. And so they went back and reformulated the lip gloss and it ended up being one of their best sellers for years and years and years. And they never would have known that if they hadn't looked at the qualitative side in addition to seeing the quantitative data. So the marriage of the two is so incredibly important. I could give you examples where qualitative doesn't match up with quantitative and the quantitative changed. You know, like it, it's it's so important to look at, at both of them to have the full picture. Kim, when you think about hiring practices, Frank sends a question. How do you think the new ways, trends of e-commerce today are impacting staffing practices and strategies? What, any thoughts on that? So I guess... When I think about when I'm looking at hiring my team, I want people, you know, and, and the beauty is there's, especially in the startup world, there's so much to be done that finding people who are just willing to get in and learn the work. Because, I mean, I remember like a few years ago, actually it was, it was probably about 10 years ago in, in early just fab days and thinking about hiring, you know, heads of social media. And at the time, you know, you can't really find social media directors with, seven years experience, 10 years ago, it didn't exist like that. So I think that what's happening now is, I mean, there's so much really great talent who may not have all the years of experience, but are insanely knowledgeable about really modern ways to market to customers because they are just passionate about certain channels on social media or a really understanding of other things. So I think that there's, there's a, a lot to look at in terms of not just years experience, but what is the relevant experience that they have? People who are passionate about data, people who, you know, I think that data and analytics in fashion and beauty never seems like a, an area to focus on, yet it couldn't be more important. And so, you know, I think in many ways, some of the most important hires to be made are going to be in data and analytics because they're the ones who are kind of reading both the qualitative and the quantitative and helping digest that for all parts of the business. And so um, I, th and, and again, finding someone with, you know, 20 years of data analytics and e-commerce may not be like the easiest thing to do, but you might find someone with five years experience who are incredibly talented and, and smart. And so I think that because there's so much newness, you know, like I, I, I don't know a lot about AI personally. I know what it can do, but I, and I'm going to be hard pressed to find someone at a direct, a traditional director level with 10 years experience doing it. But if I'm in a business where I feel like trying on glasses and, you know, online and all of those things happening online, finding people with that level of experience, um, you just want someone who understands it and knows how to do it really well, and then can learn the rest of it because, you know, in startup world, we're all learning every single day. We just have to find people who are open to that. <laughs> Tracy, and, you know, yeah, I would it. add on um, yeah, with, when when Kim and I worked together, we had people on our team that weren't that didn't think of themselves as data people, and they were top performers. So it's not necessarily that whether you are a data person or not, but if you pay attention to the data. So I don't need a graphic designer on my team who knows how to calculate cost per acquisition. Right. But I need a graphic designer on my team who, when I say this ad worked, this one didn't, they know how to make more of this than that. And they know to pay attention to the data and what it means for their role. And so I think that's, um, you know, if you're scared of numbers and not comfortable with them, it doesn't mean that you're not hireable. It means that you need to understand how you change what you do based on the numbers that someone else can interpret for you. Mm, it's, uh, yeah, thank you. That is good input. Um, Wendy asked a question for you, uh, Tracy. She says, you explained that e-com returns are difficult in the future would be easier. So her question is, if it becomes easier to return, will that impact return, return percentages? She says, currently some don't actually do the returns because of the hassle. I totally relate to this. Once it's easier, will more people return product? 
Yeah, probably. Um, you know, brands that have a return fee that they charge a restocking fee, do you see some increase in returns when they take that away? I've tested that twice in my career. Um, but you usually are offsetting that by the increased customer loyalty, the repurchase rate from that customer. So if you think about the long-term value of that customer, you might get one more return than you would have in the past, but you might get four more purchases. So it'll be balanced out by by the positive that comes out of it that's a great question yeah i, I thought so too um diego asks who in the market is taking the lead in storytelling and marketing to support more the digital channels and bring in more not only revenue but brand awareness so i'm wondering i, I guess to simplify it who's sort of making that great balance that you guys see when it comes to the marketing between revenue sales and brand awareness kim who are your best examples? Now I'm thinking, I mean, I feel like I've listed a whole bunch already and so I'm trying to come up with off the top of my head, some of the other ones. Um, Tracy, if you have one at the top of your mind, feel free to jump in. I think, you know. <laughs> no, I love, I, I, I'll help you and throw in my Please. idea. Please. Patagonia. I think in terms of a brand that has done so well on digital, cause I follow them. And so then I also get their marketing. Mm -hmm. I, I get a lot from them that is about the brand and then a lot for that. I mean, they get me to buy their used stuff. They've done such a great job. I'm buying directly from them used products sometimes. Like that, I, that to me is, if, if Diego, if you're looking for a brand to follow, that would be one I would point you to. Any other thoughts, ladies? Or I could go to the next question. I think Skims does a great job um, to reference one of Kim's brands. I think they are amazing storytellers. I think um, the I think that the textile brands are great at storytelling. Um, Fabletics, Just Fab, Shoe Dazzle, all clear differentiations. Savage X Fenty, of course. Um, I think Sephora does a really good job. They're, the the interesting thing about them is they actually they do sell some of their own brand, but they're a house of brands, you know, like a traditional department store model where they sell their own brand, but they also sell a lot of other brands. And yet on top of that, they've been able to create their own brand identity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they, they have a great storytelling that makes beauty kind of fun and magical. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Let me get to this one because I think it is, it's relevant for 2020. Social justice, equality, BLM movement, cancel culture. This year we saw brands quickly adjust their business marketing significantly. We also saw quite a few brands come under fire for not being inclu inclusive at all or enough, or you know, I'll just add some of them were phony about it. So can you talk about how you see for the future of brands who don't get on board or brands who are incongruent with their message of equality? Any thoughts on that as you lead these corporations? What are you guys thinking about? You know, I, th it, I think that it's not, um, it feels terrible that it feels like a trend of this year. I don't think it's a trend. I think it's definitely a shift entirely in how businesses are targeting customers. I think that when you look up, you know, you look back at brands of yesteryear, um, when you think about Victoria's Secret and the angels and the really skinny models and them having the first woman of color when she walked the one, walked the runway for them, you know, those all felt like really big moments. Now it's an expectation. You are trying to attract all customers. They're not just you know, skinny white women in fashion and beauty. They are so much more diverse than that. And I think that brands that don't get on board with the fact that that's what advertising and marketing is supposed to look like will continue to fall behind. It was exactly what happened with Victoria's Secret. They took such a clear stance to stay true to that brand. And they struggled for a little bit after that, you know? And, and I think that they weren't willing to evolve the way so many of the modern brands already did. And obviously this year there was such a, there's been such a, a, mo a political moment around it, but I think it's just made it more cemented in the ethos of how our brands talk to our customers. Our customers want to be able to see themselves in these brands. And that doesn't mean I think that where fashion and beauty has always, ha have always sort of led with is being aspirational. And I think that aspirational doesn't just mean what it's always meant, which is skinny white women. It is so much more aspirational to have really awesome women of all shapes and sizes, of ethnic diversity, of uniqueness about them. And I think that it's not about 
leaning into it. To your point, they're a brand that it feels like they just plopped the one diverse model in to make it feel like they had to do it. And so that's what it is. When you look at a brand like Aerie, I think that that's actually going back to the previous question where our brands that have done a really good job, I think Aerie from American Eagle, like they came out, you know, they did this, you know, very inclusive. They stopped doing retouching to their photos. They really, and, and it, by the way, you scroll their pages, like these are some gorgeous, gorgeous women. They just don't look like what Victoria's Secrets website looked like, you know, five years ago. And I think that brands have to be thinking about how to attract all of the customers out there. And I think that it's such, all, all the brands that aren't are falling behind and, um, and it's not, it's not a trend. This is, this is how brands need to be thinking about it going forward. Tracy, I'll give you the last word. Any, any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's incredibly important, like Kim said, that you know who you are as a brand. You know, in the old years, it used to be you as a marketer had the opportunity to put a picture in a window in a store and maybe send a direct mail piece. And that was your only conversation with the customer. Now you need to have much more depth as a brand. You need to know where you stand on issues and you need to make sure that you are prepared to talk about it with your customers. Uh, we did in, in 2019 for New York and Company, we had a, a photo shoot where uh, we had five women of color, two transgender females. And we got some feedback from a small but vocal group of customers who did didn't like it. And, uh, you know, there was a question posed to me as the CMO at the time of how are we going to respond to this? And I said, ask them why they didn't complain when we had five skinny white women in the window. Right. So, you know, we need to, we need to take a stand on these yes. things and really make sure that you have a point of view as a brand. And it should be clear to everyone in your organization, what you're going to say when those issues come up. Um, I will leave it there with the two of you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, if I can just thank you for your time and for the knowledge you've shared with us. And I'll just throw in the plug that in addition to all the amazing leadership you do in the retail community, you also both take the time to teach for us. And so we're, we're so grateful for all of the time you give us um, in every way, shape and form. So thank you to you both. Thank you Thanks, guys. Tom. Next month in January, we're going to kick off the <laughs> year talking about the future of zero waste. Uh, there's a lot of information to dive into there. So you'll definitely want to tune in to that one. We'll talk about the beauty industry. We'll talk about denim. We'll talk about retail. Um, after that, we'll look at the future of data, which as we alluded to in today's episode, there's so much to discuss when it comes to data. So what does data do for us as we move into the future? You'll receive a link in the next day or two to a recording of today's episode, as well as the RSVP links for both of these upcoming events. So we look forward to seeing you for them. Until we meet again, of course, we always remind you to stay inspired. And from all of us here at the college, we wanna wish you a happy holidays and hope that you stay healthy during this really difficult time in our community. So have a great holiday and we'll see you in the new year.